Again, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to introduce our final keynote of the event. Frances Moore LePay was born in Pendleton, Oregon. She has connections to Indiana. She, of course, was a graduate of Earlham College, which is just down the road in Richmond. Uh, and it was from that experience that she launched the career that uh, we're going to hear some about uh, today. Uh, Frances has a passion for the democratic process. She, she lets it infuse her work and as a result has co-founded two different national organizations, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, which is based in California, and the Center for Living Democracy, which was a 10-year initiative which encourages regular citizens to contribute to problem solving in all dimensions of public life. In the spirit of that, Francis is working on another book, and we will be circulating this uh, clip chart. And those of you that would be interested in communicating with Francis and giving her feedback as she develops the book, please sign up and uh, get on the list. In uh, 2002, uh, Francis and her daughter Anna published Hope's Edge, The Next Diet for a Small Planet. Like other visionary leaders, she sees hope as something to be lived, not sought after. To quote, a lot of people think we find hope by marshalling evidence and proving there is grounds for it. But hope isn't what we find in evidence, it's what we become in action, end quote. It's not surprising, of course, that her next book is entitled Choosing Courage in a Culture of Fear. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Francis Moore LePay. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, I am delighted to be here. I'm actually awake. I can't believe it. I think uh, the adrenaline works. Uh, I just, uh, Bob, could you just pour me some water there? Um, I am so delighted to think of the progress that you all are making over these eight years. And it gives me uh, great courage uh, to see it. And um, I, as I was thinking this morning how to begin, the words of D. Hawk came to mind. He is the founder of Visa, and he said, it is far too late, and things are far too bad for pessimism. <laughs> and I think that's kind of my attitude these days. We can't afford it. Um, and yet, just to ground us, yet I know um, what I am aware of every day, that um, of course, we figured out uh, even more than when I was 26 and started writing Diet for a Small Planet that we've turned food. We're the first species that has turned food into a health hazard. Um, how did we do that? And I realized that um, at the same time that today 100 million more people are going hungry, now we've reached in the last two years, we've now pushed the number over a billion, many, many more than when I began my work addressing the roots of hunger. And at the same time, at the same time, we have record harvests. And actually, since the 1980s, we have increased per capita food production by about 20%. So this is the world that we are in. Um, and, of course, we also know that our food and agriculture is a key part of now what is heating our planet, uh, contributing roughly a third of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, but I, I list all these things, and this is just about food and agriculture, but just to then get to my key point, that none of these, and I could go on and you could add your list, none of these crises is really the problem. And the reason that I feel I can say that is that I think that the solutions to all of them are known. So the only real problem is people's feelings of powerlessness to manifest the solutions that are known. And that is what my talk about is this morning is about. Uh, how do we shift our framing to enable us to feel and have 
involving rethinking power itself, how do we find the power to manifest what we know. And so when I say that solutions are known, let me just very, very briefly uh, suggest what I'm talking about when I say solutions are known. Um, we know now, based on many studies, but one in particular that struck me at the University of Michigan in 2007, that if the whole world went organo organic sustainable, that we could actually increase food production worldwide and with much greater quality, as we know that organic food, on average, uh, is about 25 percent more nutrient dense. Uh, so if we look at uh, what we know then, we know how to end poverty. <laughs> We know how to do that. We were well on our way in this country as well. And of course, poverty is at the root of hunger in our world. We know how to end it. We, during the 1960s, that decade that, uh, that I came into adulthood in, we had cut the poverty rate in this country by half. We can look to the Indian state of Kerala, where the population the size of Canada has reached longevity levels, education levels, infant survival rates that are equal to, virtually to the industrial countries on 5% of the per capita income in the United States. So on many levels, whether we're talking about climate change, I, I should say there too that a, pen, a partly Pentagon funded study that Amory Lovins, uh, the physicist worked on, came, up to, came to the conclusion that was simply devoting um, I calculated it's about a fifth of what, on average, we're spending in Iraq over 10 years. We could be, over, over a few decades, off of oil in this country. Uh, there are many other studies pointing that same direction. We know how to do that, too. So if we know, if we know that the solutions are there, then I think my case that the only thing really standing in our way is a feeling of powerlessness to be part, to be manifesting the solutions, and that's what I see you directly working on. And that's why I'm so delighted to be here. So uh, then if solutions are known, then what is it? And this is what has been kind of get, getting me up for the last few decades, trying to figure out what could be powerful enough if, to, to keep us feeling uh, so powerless, so unable to manifest the world that we want. Because, of course, nobody back in your hometowns, on anywhere in the world, are people getting up and saying, yes, 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 I want to heat the planet, destroy more species. Yes, 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 I want more child, children to die of hunger in a world where there's plenty of food. So if none of us would really choose this world, then what is powerful enough to keep us creating it? I think we have to go that deep to figure out how to move out of it. And in my, in my uh, search, where I am now, and uh, I... While I think of it, I want to uh, add to what Bob was saying, that I'm working on a book now called Liberation Ecology, and I'm trying to do it in a different way. I'm trying to walk my collaborative talk. And so I'm doing a very limited printing. I'm not going to do a bookstore sales or media tour. I'm asking people to read this. If you would be willing, any of you, to read my first limited edition, you can pre-order it. I have a little flyer in that basket that's moving around. And then give me feedback, because it is... What I'm trying to articulate is what you all are doing. And uh, then I would rewrite it next summer with your input. So I'll just throw that in right now. And hopefully I didn't lose my place too much here. So, um, okay, back to my key point. That if um, solutions are known, if we, none of us would choose this world as individuals that we as societies are creating, then how do we understand? How do we get into this mess? where we have vast poverty and hunger while vast abundance, and we're heating the planet, and we know the consequences are already hitting us. So I think that there is only one thing powerful enough to have this smart, smart species creating a world that we would not choose. And that is we have to look at one distinct aspect of being human. Eric Fromm, the philosopher, wrote, it is man's humanity that makes him so inhuman. 
And what Eric Fromm then goes on to explain in The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness is that it is our unique and beautiful capacity to create interpretations, uh, the, the, the lenses, the filters through which we see the world that determine what we can see and what we cannot see, and therefore what we think human nature is, and therefore what we believe is possible. Now this is just what human beings do, and it's fine as long as we have these, what Anna and I, my daughter and I call our mental maps, as long as our mental maps are life-serving, as long as they are promoting life, ours and others and our beautiful planets. But my thesis this morning is that you and I are born into this era in which the dominant mental map that is now going global is fundamentally not life-enhancing. I'll make the case, I want to very briefly, that it is malaligned. The mental map that we've absorbed is malaligned with ecology itself, the nature of nature, and human nature as well. I know that sounds a little preposterous, but I'm going to see if I can do it in a very short time. <laughs> what I'm, I'm suggesting is that it is the, the, the premise that we absorb in our culture of our mental map that we now have to sort of bring up to consciousness and look at, the premise of it is lack, insufficiency, not enoughness. It is a premise of not enough of anything, not enough food, not enough energy, not enough love. And in Boston, I always say, not enough parking places. It is a premise that is fundamentally about fear of being without. And it's not just that there's not enough stuff of energy and food, etc. But there's not enough, so I call that not enough goods, but there's also the premise of not enough goodness. That we absorb the notion increasingly over the last few decades that if you pull away the fluff from human nature, all you can really count on is that we are selfish, materialistic, and competitive. And we've got to build on that, because that's all that we can be certain of. And so from that premise, the lack of goods and goodness, this fear of uh, not enoughness, we create rules uh, that end up manifesting those very, very premises. We create what we fear. This was my first kind of aha moment at age 26 when I realized, wait a minute, we are actually creating the scarcity that we say we fear. I, my first wake up was the realization that we feed 16 pounds of grain and soy, 16 pounds to get one pound of beef in this country, and that we feed over a third of all the food, fish caught in the world and all of the grain grown in the world we're now feeding to livestock, which we turn a tiny, uh, a small fraction to us. So we create what we fear based on the premise of lack. And from the premise of lack follows that we're, we feel so deficient that we really can't count on anything other than the competitive, selfish, materialistic, that we feel we turn over, we must turn over our fate to some infallible law somewhere that will sort it out. And many have felt they have found it with the magic of the market, which was um, Ronald Reagan's wonderful term. And, uh, but of course, it's not any kind of market that we've uh, selected. It is one particular kind of market that is based on a single rule, highest return to existing wealth, those who own shares and uh, those who um, are the executives of the company. So there's market system is wonderful. Capitalism is wonderful, but if it is based on one rule, we're really in big trouble because wealth so concentrates, concentrates, concentrates that um, th we end up with 90% uh, of Americans now make less, the 90% of households in America make less in real uh, income than they did when I graduated um, when I wrote Diet for a Small Planet in the early 70s. 90% of us, about $40,000, $4,000 on average less, while those in the top 1% then continue to accumulate. So that is not about bad people, good people. It is about a premise of lack, 
a premise of lack that drives us to create the experience of scarcity because of the extent of poverty and deprivation that it ensures. And so then the question is, um, that ends up then, this spiral of powerlessness ends up in creating a world that we would not choose. And I would suggest then that it is malaligned with, nat with nature of nature, if you will, because in nature it's all about uh, the, um, the widest dispersion of energy and in that sense of power. And it is um, certainly uh, malaligned with human nature. And I want to underscore here what I mean by that, is that I want to make sure that you don't misunderstand I don't think that the crisis that we're in has anything to do with human greed per se. I think it has to do with this false premise of lack. But part of that is the premise of lack of goodness. And when I say malaligned with human nature, I just want to underscore that um, if you look uh, that the, what to me is most aligned with what we know about nature, including our own, is to recognize the incredible complexity of human beings that certainly we can, we can certainly be selfish, materialistic, and competitive solely. But we would not have gotten to 6.8 billion if that's all we are, certainly not. That there are other features which are actually more distinctively human than those. Those, there are other features that really characterize our species as, in a more distinct way. And I just want to mention a few of them. Um, I just want to mention a few of them. That we are, um, one, we are innately cooperative. And I love the new science coming out about this, cooperation and empathy. The, um, at Emory University, they looked at our brains when we were cooperating and we were competing, and they found that when human beings cooperate, that parts of our brains are stimulated that's similar to when we eat chocolate. <laughs> Empathy. Babies cry at the sound of other babies crying, but typically not at the sound of their own voices. Uh, we take such pleasure in cooperation that one science, uh, a, a study just reported in Science a year or so ago found that when a group of people, subjects were given money to spend on themselves and others to spend, uh, another group to spend uh, a certain amount of money on, on other people, that at the end of the period, that those who had given the gifts, those who had bought something for another were much happier. But the interesting thing for me is that those people were surprised because they had absorbed the message of our culture that self-seeking makes us happy. And so they were being human and getting much more pleasure from actually the cooperation of, of gift giving. And so we realize that also we are hardwired for basic fairness. And so a world in which, in which such extremes of power exist that um, over a billion people are going hungry, that is abrading our natural sense of fairness. And I say natural because I think there's a great deal of evidence that we evolved in very tight-knit tribes, knowing that unfairness is what would break up the community, what would destroy the community. And this is why Adam Smith, who is known as the godfather of greed, actually was a profound moral philosopher who understood this. And he talked about no, we, that human beings know that our preservation depends on the preservation of community. And so he wrote, there, uh, there are some social sentiments which are um, optional, but quote, we are in some peculiar manner tied, bound, and obliged to the observation of justice. So we can count on that too, that we have innate sense of fairness. In fact, even, even other primates do, that capuchin monkeys will actually throw back a ration if they think they've gotten a raw deal. So um, we are um, innately capable and most of us experience these in, this very deep-rooted sense of cooperation, of empathy, of fairness. And equally important, we are... Uh, we are creatures who thrive 
on having voice, on having power. As Eric Fromm, again, and many others have observed that, uh, well, I love the way Eric Fromm put it. He said, we should get rid of the Descartes notion about us that I think, therefore, I am. Our thought process defines human beings. He said, actually, more powerful is our need to make an imprint. So he said, we should toss out Descartes, and it should be, I am because I affect. So cooperation, empathy, fairness, and the need for efficacy to know that we are making a difference. And then, of course, our need for meaning and our unique quality as human beings to be creative and imaginative, which shows up very, very early in children. So what I'm suggesting is that um, this, the, the, the worldview that we absorb as like an invisible ether in this country uh, and in our culture and now spreading throughout the world actually does not honor and bring out these in distinctly uh, positive aspects, the pro-social aspects. And this is one of the reasons uh, that we are where we are today. So the question then, what, looking at human history and looking at us in lab experiments where we're the guinea pigs, what are the conditions that bring out the worst in us? And what are the conditions that bring out the best in us? Those are the questions that we need to be asking to move, to free ourselves, to find the power that we need to get at the very root of these global problems with which I began and that you are addressing. And I think just to really summarize it very briefly, I think it's pretty clear actually. I think whether you're talking about lab experience, experiments like the horrible one they did on us in the year Diet for Small Planet came out in 1971, there was a lab experiment in Stanford University where they put young people in these mock, this mock prison setting and they divided some into prisoners, some into guards and within, it was supposed to last two weeks but within six days they had to stop the experiment because they were so brutalizing one another. The concentration of power in that circumstance. So whether you're talking about the Holocaust or these horrific experiments, what they tell us about is this concentration of power does not bring out the best in us. It brings out the worst in us. Uh, secondly, anonymity, where we don't know one another. Uh, that also is certainly in whether you're the Ku Klux Klan with the hood on or uh, depersonalized as they were in this mock prison experiment, anonymity, not seeing the other as a true human being brings out the worst in us. And equally important, cultural norms that we generate that are finger pointing, oh no, it's not me, I didn't participate, it's got to be the other that is to blame, a scapegoating uh, norm. And so I'm suggesting then that once we can identify what brings out the worst in us, we can be part of, and that's why I'm so happy to be here, because I think you are part of shifting those norms toward mutual accountability, no longer simply finger pointing, toward creating genuine community, whether it be in your campuses, in your companies, or in your local communities as you work to bring more local provisioning to your institutions. You are moving away from the anonymity of, that leads to othering, and you are creating real community. And the concentration of power. When I think of all the things that you are doing by your very stepping up and assuming voice in your communities, in your, on your campuses, you are, you are dispersing power. As you are working toward local provisioning, that in and of itself is breaking down uh, the very, very concentrated economic control in our economy. Uh, and working in that sense, then, you are part of shifting the very basis of what we know is at the root of the problem of our world today. But to do so, we, we have to also be reframing some of the messages that we are absorbing and often inadvertently communicating. And so, to me, language is extremely important. The framing of our predicament today is extremely important as we, as we want to grow and grow and grow our, our movements uh, so that there are more people taking co-responsibility, not just enlisting in our campaign, but being willing to be leaders themselves. And so how do we send out messages that will grow this movement for what I call uh, an ecology of democracy or living democracy, where are we are aligning with what we know about human nature 
and about the natural world and so that we can heal a planet that I'm saying none of us would choose this predicament that we're in. And so we have to go that deep and our messages are really important. So I just want to mention five quickly here that I think are, are really key to that this, that I hear and that I think aren't doing us uh, uh, a service. And one of them is a very common one of the environmental movement of, oh, we've hit the limits, we've got to power down, we've got to live, live bleaker lives because we've overrun the Earth's limits. And in fact, uh, in one ecological economics textbook I saw recently, the authors wrote that uh, it was the uh, fossil fuels that freed us from the fixed energy flow of the sun. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I don't think so. I think German uh, philosopher, um, I mean, excuse me, the German physicist, uh, Hermann Scheer, or, I'm sorry. I'm mixing my Germans up. Um, actually, I did want to quote a German physicist, but I'll, uh, I'll just say that. Um, and then I'll go back to my point. I love the remark of German physicist Hans-Peter Dürer, who describes the ecological worldview that you are helping us to create, the moving away from this one, which I think of the mechanical worldview based on scarcity and fear. And he said recently, he said, in this world, in this mental map that we are moving into that is truly reflective of ecology, and I would then add our human, our real human nature, the complexity of it, he said, there are no parts, there are only participants. And I love that because the worldview we move from is one of separateness, lack, fear, um, stasis, um, to the ecological reality of always interconnected, uh, always changing, and the widest, therefore, dispersion um, of energy. So anyway, back to this other um, German I was about to quote. Uh, so the limits idea that we've hit the limits, we've got to power down. Um, well, um, uh, German um, energy leader um, um, Hermann Scheer says that, of course, every day the sun supplies us with 15,000 times the dose of energy uh, that we're now using in fossil fuel. Uh, so th the, the, the real lesson then is not that, um, that uh, fossil fuels freed us but that fossil fuels entrapped us. That's the, the shift so that we're saying, hey, let us release ourselves from this entrapment. Because as we know, fossil fuels are highly concentrated physically, and it takes tremendous mass of capital to extract a fossil fuel. And therefore, it makes us dependent on those who have that concentrated wealth. I think only of, you know, the image of Nigeria comes to mind. Uh, so that as we begin to uh, celebrate what Hermann Scheer points out, the energy of the sun in all its forms, um, that uh, we can then create more dispersed social power as well as, dis as dispersed physical power. So I'm delighted when I was uh, reading about Denmark, for example, with the, the, uh, the wind energy there, that I calculated that one out of every 13 families in Denmark is an investor in either directly, individually, or through a cooperative of uh, wind energy. And that in Germany, that's making such headways, uh, leading in so many ways in renewable energy, that 80% of the small installations there that are have now made uh, Germany about 15% uh, um, uh, 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 renewable in electricity. 80% of those units are householders that have installed these uh, dispersed um, ways to generate energy. So the second message, though, that I want to challenge with you this morning is the, of the that I receive sometimes from the environmental environmental movements is that uh, growth is the problem so we must strive for no growth and I think this is also a problem because what is nature all about what are my granddaughters about they're about growth <laughs> and so to say no growth can be pretty terrifying and, and feed the fear that is so rampant in our country anyway and so what I like to point out is that what we should really 
the reframe that I think would be most helpful for us to engage in is the reframe that what we are now doing is not growth. It is waste and destruction. It is not growth. And what I mean by that is um, New York Times reported last year an uh, overview study that uh, about 56% of all energy in the U.S. is wasted. Uh, about uh, 40 to 50% of the food. Um, and that um, in the book Natural Capitalism that uh, Amory Lovins and his partners suggest that of all the materials that are Gen that are uh, mobilized to create the things that Americans use, uh, only about 6% of it ends up in the products that we enjoy. So there's tremendous waste and tremendous instruction. And so therefore, I think we should name it that. <laughs> That's what we've been doing and call what we are working toward real growth, real growth that is aligned with the furtherance of life. And um, so, I think that that is, is key. Um, the other piece of this reframing that I think is so necessary is that uh, often I hear the message, like I, I adore E.O. Wilson and his work, He's, but he, it drives me crazy when he talks about how we have to get over Stone Age emotions, that somehow that's our big problem. And many people, uh, uh, English writer Philip Pullman talks about how we have to get over, we have to overcome millions of years of evolution and to change our nature. The implication is that we are too selfish and materialistic and we have to get over that. And I've already laid out for you uh, my response in a sense to that is that indeed we can be very much simply that caricature, the narrowly selfish and materialistic and competitive. But as I've outlined, we also have these very deep pro-social needs and capacities and we know what it takes to tap them. So let us celebrate those. But then there is yet another, a fourth message that I think that we need that I feel that you are part of remaking. And that is the idea that humans, you know, we really resist change. Uh, we love our, you know, especially here in America, freedom. We resist rules. We bristle at any kind of rules or regulations. And so therefore, somehow, uh, and I, 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 you know, some of my best friends kind of think this way, that we kind of have to trick people to do the right thing, you know, or we have to really impose, impose it on them. And so I love, to kind of reframe that too, that actually nature is all about rules and that what gives our life meaning from uh, the Ten Commandments to marriage vows is, is a sense, a shape of the rules that guide us. And the wonderful thing now that we can discover is that nature provides rules that aren't arbitrary. They are just there for us. And uh, we don't have to debate them. We just have to learn about them. And we can work with nature's laws. And so we realize that actually human beings change very fast and are eager to change when it makes sense to them. And I'm sure that you are discovering that on your campuses. And one of my favorite examples of this um, is the plastic bag ban that began uh, at least I first heard of it went in this country, in San Francisco. Something like five million bags each month were eliminated just by banning the use of plastic bags in, in drugstores and other places. And so um, uh, Ross uh, Mir Karimi, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he, had a, he, had, he was doing an interview not too long ago in which, um, in which uh, he said, uh, you know, we got calls. We got calls from this city and that city. Then we got calls from Europe, everybody wanting to know how do we do this. And he said, I think we started a wildfire of common sense. <laughs> And that's what I feel that you are doing. You are starting a wildfire of common sense that pe when it rings true, when it, oh yeah, why not? You know, I can be part of that. And uh, it makes me feel better to, this is the kind of, of, of group action that makes total sense, that makes people feel better about uh, their lives, not put upon. And uh, so that's why I see this renewable laws, for example, that started in Germany, where uh, I think of them as reward renewable laws, where householders are rewarded at a really good rate for generating renewable energy. It is just taking off now in 40 countries, just passed in Fort Myers, Florida, with a unanimous vote, went 
through very quickly because it made sense to people and people wanted to be part of it. I love too the, 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 the realization that this movement, this global movement that I, I learned about when I was in Europe, it's not very well known here. How many of you know about Plant for the Planet? Plant for the Planet is a UN initiative uh, that set the goal of, um, I believe it was uh, planting something like five billion trees. And they had for several years hence from now. And by this summer, they had the world movements that were part of this, a lot of school children involved in the uh, groups I met in Germany of school children planting trees, had planted the four billionth tree. And they had to, the UN had to up the count to make the goal higher because they'd already moved ahead too fast because it was something people could do to be part of the solution. Um, and so uh, the, the fifth message I would like to eradicate then uh, that it follows in my mind is that I often feel from, from in the world that I operate that many people are giving up on real participatory action and thinking that things are so bad that democracy is just not a strong enough tool, whether it's democracies in the committees you sit on or at a much uh, 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 more centralized level. But um, this is, I think, the biggest, pro the biggest mistake any of us could make. And so I would quote Al Gore to say, in order to solve the environmental crisis, we've got to solve the democracy crisis. And I agree with that both at our national level and all through our political levels, but I also believe that at the most local and institutional level, that is only as we practice what I've come to call the arts of democracy and see that learning uh, to dialogue and common problem solving and creative conflict and mediation and these skills of doing together, building on that, that innate capacity for cooperation, but knowing that there are there, it's still an art we must learn that this is the key to solving the environmental problem. And in fact, it is nature itself. I love to remind people that in nature, as Hans Peter Durer put, there are no parts, there are only participants, and that there are no top-down controls. Uh, it is through context and interconnection, interaction, that things happen in nature and uh, even at the molecular level, but I, I noted reading about the red deer who are native to Britain, that it's not a, you know, the, the, the people who study animals used to think it was all the kind of the top dog who, who kind of drove everything, but actually it's not so much that way, that the red deer move only when um, about 60% of the adults stand up. And uh, in uh, Africa, the, the buffalo, the African buffalo, they move in the direction of the female's gaze. They all kind of figure out how we're going to turn. So I'm suggesting then that um, this, uh, this is the last time that we should be doubting the capacities of democracy. We should be deepening democracy at every level, challenging the level, challenging uh, the role of money in our political system, and there is a movement now to remove that power and to, and to, uh, down to our, uh, the way that we operate. But to do all of this, to do all of this means that uh, the rethinking that we have to do uh, becomes very, very personal. And so I would like to just end with uh, a more personal note and suggesting that uh, as I began this far-ranging talk, I suggested that the problems are not the problems themselves, but only our feelings of powerlessness to address them, because solutions are known. Solutions are known. Or they, if they're not, of course, known in the f uh, infinite detail, we have the capacity to do that. I'm convinced of that. I think there's tremendous evidence. So then the question becomes for each of us, if that is true, then how do we empower? How do we empower ourselves and others? And how um, do we ensure that uh, we don't contribute to the sense of despair that keeps us from becoming the problem solvers that the world so desperately needs? And so, 
My answer to that is we have to rethink power itself. Because among so many people I know, power is a dirty word. Power is something that is coercive or, uh, you know, uh, even violent. Power is a dirty word. So what if we took power back to its root? In Latin, power means capacity. To be able is what it means. So if we really make sure that we are defining power in an ecological sense of co-creation, which of course is the nature of nature, everything is co-created one moment to moment, uh, that um, we do not have to fear our power or others' power. We have to make it mutually creative mutually creative through developing the collaborative arts I call the arts of democracy. So that means though uh, to find our power, this creative power that the world most needs of us today, we also have to rethink fear itself because fear of course ties our hands, paralyzes us. I think the most common reaction to fear is not flee or, or fight, the most common uh, is freeze. So we have to rethink fear itself and build what I call civil courage, a wonderful term I learned in Leipzig, Germany, um, civil courage. And what I mean by that, if we have civil courage, we recognize that fear itself is simply uh, something that we evo that evolved in us when we were on the savannah, knowing that you know separating the, from the tribe was really scary because that might be the end of us, and knowing that you know we saw that line in the grass that those the the pounding heart, the hair on end, that those were really reliable, but you and I are alive at this point, where we have to 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 move toward life is often to separate from the pack because if the tribe, the hyper tribe is trapped in a false view of the world in which we live in our own nature, then we really do have to separate and choose this ecological pathway. And so that's going to bring up fear because that's how we're wired. So rethinking fear is simply something that is an experience, a sensation. It's information, but it's not a verdict. And so I encourage myself, and this is I'm really talking to myself uh, as well as anyone else, to think always of fear as information, not something I'm ever going to get over if I continue to go into the unknown because we're hardwired, again, from our evolutionary roots to be uh, concerned about the unknown. It might be fearful. We, we might get eaten or we might be, again, banished from the tribe if we step too far. But this is just information. It might be telling us we're exactly where we need to be to do what we need to do for ourselves and others. Building courage, building courage, seeing fear in this new way, uh, rethinking power, means also that um, we can recognize that we are so socially embedded with one another, we are so intensely connected with one another, that neuroscience, neuroscientists have discovered that there are actual mirror neurons in our brains uh, that are if so useful if we recognize we have them. What that means is when I go like that, when I do anything here, when I conjure up images in your head, that there are actually neurons in your brain firing as if you were doing this, as if you were doing this. So think of the power that that gives one. We can choose to know that those we bring into our lives, if we want more courage, if we want a certain kind of way of being, of certain skills, certain knowledge, we bring those people into our lives who are a bit more courageous than we, and our mirror neurons will be firing, and uh, we, can, we absorb one another. It is a tremendous source of, of power for change that is available to any of us. And uh, when I think of the power that we can build uh, and you are experiencing with your colleagues, I'm reminded of, of a University of Virginia study where they put uh, college students in two different groups at the foot of a hill.
And they put backpacks on all of them, heavy backpacks. And the only difference in the two groups is that one group had a friend standing next to them, and the other group did not. And then they were asked to judge how high is that hill right in front of you. Well, those who had a friend standing next to them judged the steepness of that hill to be significantly less daunting than those who were standing alone. And the longer they had known their friend, the, the less steep the hill appeared to be. So as you think of the sources of your power, I'm sure you're experiencing this, experiencing this phenomena to, to bring those close to you who will help to lower the uh, grade of that hill that you are climbing. And I think also that, um, that uh, because of this mirror neuron phenomenon, then the more, and I'm sure you're already doing this, but I couldn't encourage you enough to keep doing it, is think of all the ways that you can continue to use photography, to use videography, to use posters, whatever it is in your institutions, to allow people to have that, that sense of participation, to trigger those mirror neurons by seeing others. We can't overdo our storytelling. By storytelling, we give people a sense of possibility that this is happening. They can be part of it. And so often I know it's so easy in my own life to get so busy that I forget to do the storytelling, even though that's my main goal in life. Uh, but to take the time, don't think of it as an extra, but all the networking that you're part of in this organization, in your, in your own institutions, to be better and better at, and, and then, then at sharing. I remember um, I was on two campuses in, um, near Minnesota, I mean near uh, Minneapolis not too long ago, and, and one campus had just built this big uh, wind turbine. They'd gotten, they'd started an environmental studies class, they'd gotten the, the board of the college on, on, on it, and they took me out to see it, their, their wind turbine that was providing a huge amount of energy for their campus. And uh, then they, they kind of chuckled uh, as they were driving me back to town. They said, yeah, you know, there's a college just a few miles down the road, now they're getting one. <laughs> so, uh, obviously it's easier if you're just a few miles down the road from another school that you say, oh, they can do it, I can do it. Uh, but it's, we, it's not always that easy, but uh, these mirror neurons, firing them is a very powerful source of our, um, of our courage. And also, um, I, I like to think that, um, that um, as we reflect on those qualities that I, rec that, I, that I enumerated earlier, those qualities that make us distinctly human, that just keeping that in mind as is part of what gives me courage to recognize that, you know, often uh, we've read, you know, anthropological work or impl implied in anthropology is that somehow uh, that uh, our innate warring, our seeming, uh, you know, our, our, our warring is what makes us human. But actually, um, you know, other, other primates can be really awful to each other, really beautiful, brutal to one another. Really what is the distinguishing human characteristic is the intensity of our capacity for cooperation that seems to have evolved because of our cooperative breeding where whole uh, family groups would care for the very young and that helped to, to inculcate in us this deep, deep empathy and capacity to read each other's minds in a sense and cooperation. And of course the distinct human quality of being able to imagine the future as you're doing in this conference and therefore to create it, that the more that we can, that we can gird ourselves with, with that understanding of what it means to be human uh, in the st these distinctive qualities, I think it builds our civil courage as well. And so when I think about uh, this idea of how do we empower ourselves and others, uh, I, I love to remind myself in an ecological worldview of this connectedness, whereas Hans Peter says there are no parts, only participants, that the only choice a person does not have is whether to change the world. Because we can't help it. By who we are, we are affecting everything around us. So the only choice we do have is 
how we change the world. And so the more that we can share that message with all whose lives we touch, that we are all world changers, and we can then choose to change in the way, in the direction that removes the, the, the conditions that I mentioned of, of concentration of power, anonymity, and scapegoating that bring out the worst in us and begin to create the kinds of conditions that you are working toward, toward the dispersion of power through, through the inclusion of more and more people in this movement and in the decision making and uh, the the face to face, the community building and now we have the internet to make that even more possible to make those real human connections as well uh, much more broadly than we ever did before and uh, the end of scapegoating, the assumption of mutual accountability, not just saying oh, it's, it's their fault up there, this, you know, the CEO or the president or whoever, and rather we are all co-responsible. So that means to me that ultimately our power is in who we are. And I think that people like you in this movement, you really, your power is that you have what I think virtually everybody wants. <laughs> That's your power in the sense that you have a sense of purpose, that you are able to walk with your fear of, you know, being in the unknown, being a different, being a little different than, than, your, than those immediately around you often, I would assume, and that great sense of purpose and then the buddies who are surrounding you and helping you, you know, lower the steepness of that hill. So in a sense, I think that uh, this is the ultimate power that we each have, who we are and therefore how we affect every single person who comes into contact with us. And so at this extraordinary moment in human history where we have to go deeper than we've ever gone before, we have to learn not to get over fear but to walk with our fear of difference as we seek out uh, to stimulate others to be part of this glorious shift toward an ecological worldview, deeper understanding of human nature aligned with nature. I would like simply to end with a short poem that sort of says it all, <laughs> much more briefly than I have in an hour. Uh, in just a few lines, Denise Levertov says it all in her poem, Beginners. We have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How can we tire of hope? So much is in bud. How can desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. We have only begun to envision how it might be to live as sibling with beast and flower, no longer as oppressor. We've only begun to know the power that is ours if we would join our solitudes in a communion of struggle. So much is unfolding that must complete its gesture so much is in bud. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you for your positive energy because I think so much today, sociologists tell us about framing, right? We all are sharing similar stories, a lot of folks working in this area. There's kind of two main ways to frame things and people can focus on the negative and people can focus on the positive. And I think the way you're framing the issues and the way you're framing the solutions are really positive and they're really energetic and they're really um, uplifting to us all. And so I think I know personally now when I go home, instead of some of the things I've been thinking about, of, oh, these are the problems we're, we have to surmount and, and this is the difficulty we're going to have, it's much more energizing and it's much more fun for, for people to think about things in a positive light. And so I think that's, I think that's very effective. And so I thank you for putting on a smiley face and being up there and having energy. I think it's wonderful. The morning. Yes. And I don't think it's your coffee. I think it's, I think it's deeper than that. And so I, I thank you. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you very much. And, and, and that's why I think, um, 
I'll just make another plug for any of you to participate in my co-book writing that uh, because I'm reframing the subtitle of my new book is it's called Liberation Ecology the subtitle is reframing six disempowering messages that keep us from aligning with nature even our own and so uh, if you delightful person who just said that um, if you wanted to weigh in your, your friends on your campuses um, I'm going to be taking um, uh, all that feedback and then rewriting the book I'm going to do a very limited printing so I just so encourage you because uh, I so believe this that wherever we are the messages that we send out who we are is this the most exhilarating exciting undertaking that any generation ever did or do we oh, would you please, you know, come and help me save the world? That just doesn't work. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um, thank you for, for coming. I was wondering, one of the things that you said brings out the worst in us is the extremes of power. Yes. And I think that in many ways the university campus is a microcosm of that because you really, you, you have extreme, extremely hierarchical system and um, I work with a lot of administrators who are making the decisions for you know the entire <laughs> campus, a small city essentially. So I wonder what you know. And they're, they've been there most, many of them, for a long time. They um, don't, for the most part, many of them do not share this framing, this understanding. Especially right now, they're under a great deal of strain with the budget cuts and the gutting of the financial backbone of the university, having to lay people off. Um, how would you advise us to bring this message back, in particular to the administrators who, um, who are in that position of being more at the extreme of holding, wielding that power? Mm -hmm. Very, very critical question. Um, I'm, I flip back to a conversation I had with students at UC Santa Cruz a few years ago, and uh, you smile. Do you know people there? Um, I'm from Santa Cruz. I don't know if you. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I don't know if you recognize me, but we met when oh, we came out. Oh, so. oh my gosh! I do recognize you. I was about to quote you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so embarrassing. <laughs> well, you've got the answer, Aurora. You've got the answer. I seriously was about to quote you, so. That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, um, I'd love to hear how you would, how you would say that. Well, I, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go back to what I learned from you. And uh, so see if I got it right, teacher. <laughs> well, what I learned from Aurora is um, that you start from the stance, as I was trying to articulate, not of you're the problem, you powerful administrator, uh, but we are all creating this together, and I'm going to take some accountability too. And so the students at Santa Cruz, my understanding was that you all said, okay, we're going to step up and we're going to create a course here uh, that will involve students in thinking through how to apply what they're learning about ecology to their own lived environment and that you chose to do it and this is what I think is was that I love to share with other people and I put in my little book as you know even if it was only one sentence I got in but that you chose to <clears throat> start with learning the arts of democracy as I would put it you chose to start with training yourselves in what's called nonviolent communication but they're really uh, many approaches to it, but you started with how do we become, in my language, living Democrats? How do we become co-problem solvers so that we don't end up uh, fighting with each other instead of manifesting our goal? And then you model that, and I, you know, I remember the night I walked into the auditorium and there was this whole system that you guys had worked out for monitoring like who comes to the class and you know the students themselves were monitoring it and then how you gave feedback to one another it was so beautiful that instead of just saying oh good job or whatever or just shun shunning the person if they didn't do a great job you had immediate feedback both uh, critical and and supportive and so you were creating a, a, a modeling of a participatory process and my understanding is then what you were doing with the administration is saying, okay, we want to sit down with you and figure out how to do this together. Not that in the, my old generation's ways, we're going to sit in in your office unless you change tomorrow, you know. So 
that's what I learned from you. And that general, I'm not saying that it's gotten any, it's gotten, I mean, it's not easy, it's gotten harder, but that as, as you well know, then that some of the things you're doing are actually saving the administration money. You're actually from, you know, cleaning products to, you know, saving food waste so that you're, that you, um, you know, that, that, that you're not just saying, oh, you carry the burden. You're saying, here are some of the solutions, and we students will be part of it. And I think that's why uh, that was a few years ago, and but the little I, I've been able to follow you from afar, that it's really continued to build. So did I get it right? <laughs> I, I def that's definitely my, my, how I try to approach things. And the Education for Sustainable Living program that you came and visited is still incredibly strong in changing students' lives, and it's as large or larger than when you came. But something has happened on our campus, so maybe I'll change my question and say, how do we keep that energy of, of wanting to invite the administration to sit down alive within the students? Because in the, in the, I now work on the administrative side. I was talking to, to uh, a longtime campus sustainability activist, Julian Canary, last night, and she said, I'm an administrator now. And she's right. I'm not a student anymore, and something has happened in which the students increasingly have this huge movement on our campus that is not sitting down with the administration anymore. Hmm. They're, they're, they're really excited about creating a better world, but there's a rejecting of engaging with the people who they see as the pillars of the kind of evil society that, um, and the, the system that they don't really want to be a part of. At least yeah. that's, that's how I, what I see happening. I don't know if that's true on other campuses, um, but I definitely see that as people start to engage with this new paradigm, maybe they find a new tribe and it's harder to, um, to work within that old tribe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that. is, is, is this the, a common, uh, is this felt other places? Rings true to others? Um, I, I do think it, it goes to this whole question of framing and the blaming that is so uh, much part of the old framing of that we are separate and that we can really uh, achieve our goals simply by identifying who the bad guys are at the top and getting rid of them. And that's the lesson, I think, of ecology <laughs> for me is this co-created reality. Um, so um, I don't, Aurora, I don't have any quick answer to that except at a very personal level of engaging with those who you know and who uh, might be open to other ways of thinking about it. and. Um, so, and I would, of course, be happy to talk to anybody that you would want me to talk to, but to, to really try to shift that, um, because we, we have to assume that no matter what position a person is in, that uh, we share this common humanity of, of, of loving life and wanting it to flourish. And it's only when we're made to feel, I believe, most of us, yes, there are a few outliers, of course, in, in, any, in any generalized description, but it's only when people feel so defensive, pushed against the wall, so blamed, that they, their whole creativity stops and their willingness to, to work uh, with others stops. And I've been there, you know, I think we've all been there where we've just gotten blamed for something and then uh, we, we just freeze, part of the fear response. So reducing the fear um, on the campus is, is critical. Um, and, but it also means, I think, working with other administrators about how how they let their fear reaction uh, come out and, 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 and being part of the invitation to engage with these students who feel like somehow they're going to do it on their own. Uh, so it's, it's got to be both sides. It's got to be both sides. But it really, it, it comes down to, I think, that deep of redefining what we think of democracy. It's not just a system of a structure, whether it be the structure of a campus or the structure of our country in terms of decision making, but it is a culture, a uh, culture of, of, uh, of uh, engagement. And it is a way of life that we have to learn as, as you all started, you know, when you started the sustainability program there, you, you set out to learn more skills, to be better at it. And I think, you know, it, I think we could all do, do, do well to follow their example. Um, are there other 
Questions? One more question. Hello, thank you for coming. My name's Lorraine McCosker. I'm from Athens, Ohio, oh. and I wish I'd thought to bring my diet and recipe old tattered books for your autographs. But I'd like to thank you for revolutionizing food in the 70s. I, I was there and I remember it, and it was a very important thing in our, in our evolution. My question is, um, I believe in the power of the individual, and I work in that capacity every day, and that's how I try to live my life. And I think that we do have incredible potential uh, to, in order in, in order to um, impact change. But I, I'm often overwhelmed by the concept of the huge um, construct of power that we've created. And an example of this is, um, you know, the destructive practices of socially and environmentally of our government. An example is the Iraq war invasion and the fact that we had more people globally protesting that action and still our government proceeded. So I'd like you to comment on something because to me that brings the macro, what we deal with every day of feeling that powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, should we have continued to protest? Was it that people just gave up? You know, what, what, how do we impact change when we have this mm -hmm. huge, powerful structure oppressing us often? Well, Thank you're you. asking such important uh, foundational questions. I really appreciate it. Um, my own view, this is not responding to the Iraq war in particular, but more generally this feeling that somehow we're outgunned, you know, by our, by the, that we, over 80% of Americans believe that corporations have too much say in our system and feel that that uh, concentrated wealth is 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 too um, is too much guiding things in special interest is another, of course, buzz term. And so I think that this theme of reclaiming uh, democracy, the the structure of political democracy, is of course foundational to the living democracy that I'm talking about. So whether we're talking about decisions to go to war or, or how our health care is reformed or uh, the Markey Waxman bill or whatever it is, uh, that we have to move toward a political decision-making process that we know is fundamentally accountable to citizens and not to those who, who um, are in control of the greatest amount of concentrated wealth in the country. And so that is the critical question. And I think now, given that our Supreme Court is basically equates the right to spend with the right to speak, that <clears throat> until we're able to change the Supreme Court for, to what I think could, could see the historical um, weight behind a very different understanding of freedom, the freedom to participate that is countermanded by, by concentrated wealth in our political system, until that day that there is only one way to reclaim our political system for ourselves, and that is through citizen initiative to, uh, to push through Congress today the uh, fair elections laws that are in both bipartisan support in both houses, and then to only vote for candidates who receive public financing, who re do not receive the, the, the laws that are now fair elections um, laws now in Congress. They would cap individual contributions at, at uh, $100, and you get so many of those, and then you qualify for federal funding that would be at a high enough level that you could really compete. And this is not a pie in the sky notion, the idea that we can remove the power of wealth from our political system. It is operating now in three states, in Maine, in Connecticut, in Arizona, in, in Maine and Connecticut. Now over 80% of the legislators have run without that big, without the big bucks, uh, corporate uh, PACs and all of that behind them. And it's made a, a huge difference. In Maine, they've passed environmental legislation that was absolutely campaigned against by virtually all of the corporate interest involved, and they still passed it. It's a producer responsibility legislation that I, I just calculated that has kept one pound of lead out of the waste stream of Maine for every person in Maine in just a year and a half or a year, year to two years. And now it's going to many other states. This producer responsibility concept for a corporation is responsible for the life cycle of what it brings into the market. So 
my, my answer is that we can't give up on real political democracy in this country. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt warned us so eloquently in April 28, 1938, he addressed a joint session of Congress and he said, quote, the liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism, end quote. So he and many others, uh, Eisenhower, many of you know that profoundly uh, moving warning about uh, the military industrial complex, that, that this is something we cannot let go of. Whatever else we're working on, we can weigh in on the need for clean elections, and the only way to do it, I think, given the Supreme Court makeup, is voluntary public financing. We have a record that this is the best kept secret in America. And uh, if any of you want to, you can see my superhero, who's a beneficiary of this on our website. There's a short video about her. Uh, she, she was a waitress in Auburn, Maine in the year 2000. And because of clean elections, she was able to run for office. Uh, she was elected, has uh, been elected, re-elected four times. She was on the Judiciary Committee of the State of Maine. My point is, this is the talent out there. This is the, the beautiful talent out there waiting for opportunity if we will step up as citizens and remove the power of concentrated wealth in our political system so that every voice can be heard. And I just thank you so much, and I, I've just so loved being with you. And any of you who would want to weigh in on my little book, uh, whether or not any of you do, I really want to feature in some way what you're doing in, the most, in, in my new uh, book that would come out a year or so from now, Liberation Ecology. So I want to hear your story, so make sure that, uh, that I have a chance to do that. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. We have three last real quick comments. Uh, last night, in the flow of things, I left this on the table and it disappeared. And I thought, oh dear, this autographed book is gone and I've lost my package. Thank you, somebody, for bringing it back. I don't know who it was. It just showed up suddenly. So I appreciate that. Um, in uh, living out the theme of the conference, Embracing Change, as we mentioned, uh, this has been a partnership between Ball State University and AISHI. I want to specifically thank uh, the, the AISHI board on which I happen to be a member of, but especially the members of the board that served on the planning committee, uh, Sherry Tan, uh, Yolanda Moses, our other co-chair, thank you so much, and uh, Judy Walton for her great leadership of AISHI. Uh, she's transitioning out of the executive director position with Paul Rowland coming on, and now she's going to be doing some other things. She's really been the backbone of the organization, keeping it alive while it's been going through some transitions, so thanks for all that good work. Um, Last note, of course, is that we're going to be going over to uh, the expo for our uh, refreshments this morning. We hope you all have safe travels home after your sessions this morning, and thank you so much for being here.